One last one, please. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Kul mu'minin wal mu'mina thawab al-fatiha. Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim <laughs> المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعن الله على الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد فقال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والفجر وليال عشر والشفع والوتر والليل إذا يسر هل في ذلك قسم لذي حجر ألم تر كيف فعل ربك بعاد إرم ذات العماد التي لم يخلق مثلها في البلاد وثمود الذين جابوا الصخر بالواد وفرعون ذي الأوتار الذين تغوا في البلاد فأكثروا فيها الفساد فصب عليهم ربك صوت عذاب إن ربك لبالمنصاد فأما الإنسان إذا مبتلاه ربه فأكرمه ونعمه فيقول ربي أكرما وأما إذا مبتلاه فقدر عليه رزقه فيقول ربي أهانا كلا بل لا تكرمون اليتيم ولا تحاضون على طعام المسكين وتأكلون التراث أكلا لما وتحبون المال حبا جما كلا إذا دكت الأرض دكا دكا وجاء ربك والملك صفا صفا وجاء يومئذ بجهنم يومئذ يتذكر الإنسان وأن له الذكرى يقول يا ليتني قدمت لحياتي فيومئذ لا يعذب عذابه أحد ولا يوثق وثاقه أحد يا أيتها النفس المطمئنة ارجعي إلى ربك راضية مرضية فادخلي في عبادي وادخلي جنتي سلوات Master of our age, Imam Zamana, my respected elders, brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum Jami'an wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Our discussions in the last couple of nights have allowed us to see what the tyrannical leaderships of previous communities were like and therefore to observe how these characteristics are mirrored within the tyrants at the time of the master of the martyrs, Abi Abdullah al Hussein, salawatullahu salamu alayhi. And yesterday we looked at a, another group of verses in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents diametrically opposed opinions as to how to approach various scenarios. And he shows that there is a kind of person that when he is tested and his sustenance is given and increased to him, his response will be, my Lord has honored me, my Lord has given to me. But when another test comes and a person has his rizq, فَقَدْرَ عَلَيْهِ 
that that risk is the one which is straightened, that risk is the one which is squeezed upon him and maybe reduced, that the response changes and that person now complains about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and says that my Lord has now disgraced me. And we went into some analysis yesterday that the outlook of a person, a perspective of a person, should be that he is honored during both times. That whether the test comes with risk or without risk, that he is still honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at no point is he ever disgraced by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, it can only be the oppressor that is disgraced by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, with that in mind, with that sequence of verses in mind, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now changes the direction again of this chapter. And now he speaks about why a person may have his risk straightened. The fact is, as we stated yesterday, that all of us are familiar with this scenario of gaining and losing worldly blessings. There are none of us here that have not gone through the peaks and troughs, the hills and the valleys, the ups and downs of life. And indeed, every day that we live, we will continue to go through those ups and downs. One of the reasons Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents this next sequence of verses is in order to establish that for the one who does have his risk straightened, for the one that goes through that process of that particular test, there may be reasons that one can look to specifically as to why that risk may actually be straightened. Now as we go broader, we stated yesterday that risk is not just wealth. Risk is that everything, every blessing that is given to you and I, that health can be our risk, that our, uh, any goodness that is given in our life can also and rather should be considered as the risk that is given to you and I. There is that wonderful dua that we recite after our Isha Salah. And we say, my Lord, I know not where my risk is going to come from. Whether my risk is in the mountains or whether it is in the seas, whether it is in the skies or whether it is in the earth, whether it is easy for me to get to, whether it is difficult for me to get to. Ponder upon this for a minute. When we are told to recite certain chapters of the Holy Qur'an, we are told to recite certain chapters of the Qur'an because the message that is within that particular chapter is relative to the time in the day in which we are supposed to recite it. For example, we are recommended to recite Surah Al-Yaseen after Fajr prayers. We are recommended to recite Surah Al-Asr after Salat Al-Asr prayers. We are recommended to recite Surah Al-Waqi'ah after Maghrib prayers, especially for the one who wants an increase in his risk. For the one who is going through a difficult time, recite Surah Al-Waqi'ah and inshallah you will see that increase in risk. There is also the chapter of Surah Al-Mulk. Surah Al-Mulk we are recommended to recite after Surah Al-Isha because the chapter has two clear themes within it. The first one is that it is speaking about the reasons for creation and how I must go throughout my lifetime. The latter third of Surah Al-Mulk is very particular in regards to the coming of the awaited Savior and the governance of the Imam of our time, Imam al Ta'ala Fajr Sharif. Now link these two concepts together in your mind for a minute. We have a surah, a chapter that is revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is recommended to be recited every night after Surat al-Isha. Why Surat al-Isha? Why not after Fajr? Why not after Dhuhr? Because from that period, from the time in which the nightfall descends to the time in which you now go to sleep and go for Fajr Salah, this is now normally the time in which the world begins to slow down for you and I. The work has closed its doors. We are now with our family. We have more times to ourselves and thus towards our Lord. Therefore, at this time, in the night time, read this chapter so that A, you understand your responsibility within earth, but also you have more knowledge and understanding towards the relationship between yourself and the awaited Savior. Very important point. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that in this night time, develop, strengthen, increase your relationship with the awaited Savior. One. 
Therefore, at the same time, we also have that verse of Qur'an, which we know comes from Surah Al-Najm, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the infallible does not speak of his own whim. وَمَا يَنْتِقُوا عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ He does not speak of his own whim. Rather, what leaves his tongue is that which is inspiration from him. Therefore, if these du'as, these ad'iyah, which we are given each day and each night, are also coming from an infallible tongue, they are also going to have a linking, surely. The main chapter that we are obliged to recite during the night has a link towards the awaited Savior. What about that du'a at the time of Salat al-Isha? Does that not have a linking towards the awaited Savior as well? Surely there must be a meeting of the minds with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine, ver- divine verses and the words that come from the representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There would not be a dichotomy within the chapter and with the dua that we are both recommended to recite. Surely there would be a meeting of the minds at this point in time. Now review the very same dua that you recite every single night. My Lord, I know not where my rizq comes from. I don't know whether it's situated in the skies or in the mountains. I don't know whether it's going to be within the seas or whether it's going to be within the earth. I don't know whether it's in the deserts or whether it's within the cities. Now when you go back to the term rizq and you say rizq is not just wealth. Rizq is health. Rizq is beauty. Rizq is family. Rizq is every blessing given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What greater blessing could there be other than the awaited Savior? Thus, when you say, My Lord, I don't know where my rizq is. You are actually saying, My Lord, I don't know where my imam is. Is he in the skies or is he on the earth? Today, is he situated in the mountains or is he in the deserts? Is he in the city or is he in the town? Only you can bring that rizq back to me. You see the meeting of the mind? The whole reason for the surah of mulk at night is to bring us to the awaited. That da'a from the time of Isha is there to bring us to the awaited. And all this is a deeper understanding of risk. Then when you get to that understanding that there is a meeting of the minds within this, you then look at these verses and see a greater level. That it is not just about risk. When I come to that next sequence of verses and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells me why my rizq is being taken away from me, I will also understand that the reasons why my imam is not back with me. Do you see the link? Do you see how everything works in tandem with each other? So let us read these verses at a face value and understand why rizq is taken away from me. And then as we go deeper, we will understand the same verses in accordance as to why my awaited Savior has not been returned back to me. Let us turn towards Surah Al-Fajr. For those brothers and sisters who have their iPhones and their Quran with them, we will turn back towards the chapter and we can now look at these verses in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifies for us this outcome. He says, we try that person with goodness and increase in risk and he says that honor has come to him but when we try him with difficulty and فَقَدَرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَهُ at that point when the blessings are straightened his response is my Lord has disgraced me the next subsequent verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents base reasons as to why your risk may be taken away Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim كَلَّا بَلْ لَا تُكْرِمُونَ الْيَتِيمِ وَلَا تَحَاضُونَ عَلَى طَعَامِ الْمِسْكِينَ وَتَأْكَلُونَ التَّرَاثَ أَكْلَ الْلَمَّا وَتُحِبُّونَ الْمَالَ حُبًّا جَمَّا And he says, the first reason as to why risk may be taken away. Nay, but you do not honor the orphan, nor do you urge one another to feed the poor. You eat away the heritage of people, devouring everything indiscriminately without even looking at what you're eating. And you love wealth with a huge, exceeding love for wealth. These, at a face value level, are the reasons as to why risk may be taken away. And that is a fair gesture. If I am given risk, we said risk isn't just wealth. It is health, it is tawfiqat, it is opportunity, it is strength to go out there and serve. When I am given these things but I do not 
utilize the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to me, the response may be, I will take away those blessings. Know the reason for them, that you do not honor the orphans, that you do not feed the poor and the hungry, and you are willing to eat up each other's inheritance indiscriminately. When you come to this point, you understand that I am going to take back from you those things that I have given to you. If you cannot look after the trusteeship that I have given to you, why would I continue to give you that trusteeship in the future? Well, let us look at this at a very face value, and then we go deeper, inshallah. We find that when it comes to our responsibility with our wealth and tawfiqat and our strength and our health, we are obliged to use it in the best very manner. Now, one principal manner, there is a wonderful tradition from the commander of the faithful, Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahu salamu alayhi in which he beautifully says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has diversified the aspirations of mankind. Just think about those words and how well structured every word is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has diversified the aspirations of mankind. For had it been that he had created every man and every woman to be able to act and think exactly the same way, this world would have become very burdensome upon them. Imagine now you were all the same. All your capabilities, all your strengths, all your weaknesses, all your capabilities and desires and expectations. What if you were all lawyers? That would be a problem, I tell you. What if you were all accountants? What if you were all... I'm sorry if one of you is a lawyer as well. Uh, what if you were all builders? What if you were all tradespeople? How would the world that we live in today operate? It wouldn't, would it? It wouldn't be able to. What if all of you had to perform all your tasks? What if each and every one of the family had to build their own house had to harvest their own crops, had to you know, do everything from start to finish. But obviously, as a society, we are reliant upon each other to make society work. One of you might do one job. One of you does another task. One of you is skilled and specialist in another area. Who made this system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مَا تَرَى فِي خَلْقِ الرَّحْمَانِ مِنْ تَفَاوُرِ فَرْجِعِ الْبَصْرَ هَلْ تَرَى مِنْ فُتُورِ Do you see any mistake in the system of the All-Merciful? He asks you in Surah Al-Mulk. You will not be able to. Keep looking, keep looking. Your eyesight will turn back tired and fatigued from how much you try to find a problem, a mistake, an incongruity within his system of creation. This being the case, the commander of the faithful says that we are all diversified in our mindset. What is the reason for that? Principally, so that we have a working system within society. But also, that the skill set that you have been vested with by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is nothing short than His risk and His blessing to you. In the expectation that you give that risk back towards your community and society. If I have a talent... My responsibility is to give that talent back into my own community, not to say somebody else will do it. The idea is that we are all participating for the coming of that awaited Savior. Now think about it. Think about every talent that we have. I'll just throw some at random, and hopefully you'll understand and incline towards it. Let's just say a youth here sitting amongst us is very good at sport, seeing as I'm a Die-hard soccer span, I will choose soccer. Let us assume a youth here is a good soccer player. What is the responsibility of that youth towards his own community? Of course, he organizes a game of soccer, maybe once a week, once a fortnight, once a month, so that the brothers may come together and that they can keep healthy, 
that they can learn to have healthy competition. They can learn discipline. They can improve upon their own skill set. That when they are playing that sport, they learn good akhlaqi art. Now, what about the person who is very good with Microsoft PowerPoint? What is the benefit of that person? Can that person tomorrow make a poster so that next time a reciter comes, a beautiful poster is made so it advertises the lecture, that it speaks and resonates with everybody because we are human beings that are inclined towards advertising. Whatever skill set you are vested within, whatever talent you have, it is not by your own virtue. It is only because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given it to you. He expects that with that talent that he has given to you, give back towards the community. And therefore, with that understanding that that is that risk, that there I have been given different talents. We have all moved towards our various skill sets. Now with that comes the understanding that I have been given something individual and beautiful. We find that with that risk, I now must be able to give back towards that talent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us within this chapter that you do not feed those people. You do not look after those hungry. You do not give back to those people who are in need around you at that time. And that is a reason as to why you are going through these trials and tribulations. As a principle, those risks that we have given to you, you have not utilized it in the format that we expect it to give to you. He says that you do not honor the orphan and that you do not urge to feed one and other and that you eat away the heritage of each other and you love that wealth exceedingly. Now, when it comes to this issue, when it comes to being able to understand our responsibility, we find that there are many things that we are given and as a result, if we do not apply them rightly, we will lose those blessings. Imagine now, what is that perfect society that we are trying to build? What is that wonderful society that we hope to achieve so that we can hand those keys over to the awaited Savior and say, we have reached to the point whereby we are now ready to have you govern us in accordance with the way in which you want to govern us. Dhul Qarnayn. Dhul Qarnayn is not a uh, prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, a lot of these scholars would say he was a very wise man. He, had, he was not a prophet of Allah, but he was at the height of a human individual that could reach. There's a story that says one day, Dhul Qarnayn, he comes to a city. Now, as we know, Dhul Qarnayn would traverse the east and the west. And therefore, whatever he had seen, he had seen so much of this world. He comes to a city. He comes to a new city which he had not met before. And he sees something very strange within that city. He goes and he sees that every single house, every single house has a grave in front of it. That would probably scare a lot of us if we had our graves in front of our doors, in front of our houses. But this community had this practice. So he comes to them and he asks them and says, can you explain to me about yourselves? Talk to me about your community. Why is it that you have these graves situated directly in front of your own houses? They say to him, the reason for this is because we never want to forget death. He continues to discuss and he finds there a society that is perfectly molded in accordance with how a wonderful society may be. He continues to question them. He says, can you tell me, why is it that I see your houses have doors, but there are no locks on your doors? We all have locks on our doors. This one didn't. Why is it that you have doors, but no locks on the doors? Because we are a society that does not harbor any thieves amongst us. Therefore, we trust each other to the extent where we allow each other to walk into each other's houses. Okay. Why is it that I do not see any police officers, I'm paraphrasing, any police officers within your community? Because none of us are willing to take the right of somebody else away from that person. We will always give the full rights to the person so that there's no need for a court system or police officers to come and arrest someone. He says, well, what about, why is it that I see no disparity? As I walk through the community, I don't see anyone homeless. I don't see anyone in need. I don't see any orphans. Why is there no disparity amongst yourselves? 
they respond back to Durqanain. They say to him, the reason being is because we share equally amongst ourselves. We recognize the rights of each other. That when there is excess wealth within the community, we equally distribute it amongst those people who are in need. He says, well, what about why I do not see that there are any rulers amongst yourself? Why is there no king amongst yourself? Why is there no authoritative position amongst yourselves? Because we work together and never deceive each other to the point where we don't need someone to have an autocratic system above us. He says, tell me, where have you got this system? How made you, why, what is it that made you live like this? He said, because our elders constructed this society in this way, and therefore we inherited in this way. We have never seen anything other, and therefore we only follow this system within our community. Now, of course, this is an ideal scenario, which we all, inshallah, want to work to, and is within a broader confine of the hadith and the context of itself. But just understand and think where we are trying to get to, and our own understanding of what I as an individual am doing towards getting towards that perfect society. When I look at that verse and it says that the reason for my risk being taken away from me is because I do not help the orphan, because I do not help the needy, the homeless person, I ask myself again as we stated yesterday, am I the cause of my risk being taken away from me? Within my own self, within my own family, or at a broader level, within my own community, nay, with the economic disparity that we are going through around the world, with the euro tumbling, with the Dow Jones in the state in which it is, with the shares plummeting, with AA going towards chapter 11 bankruptcy, I ask myself, is it because as a community at a global level we have not honored the orphan? Because at a global level as a community we have not helped the homeless? Because at a community at a global level we have not fulfilled the responsibilities of feeding and looking after each other? You see, we can have a number of layers to a verse. And I ask myself that instead of looking at myself as an individual, I go to a bird's eye view. I sit in, in, in space and I look down at the entire globe and I look at every situation within every country and I ask, why are we going through this situation? Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about tyrants and he talked about communities and then he says about risk being taken away. Yes, at one level there was an individual being named as Fir'aun. But at another level, he speaks about communities. And then he goes towards the issue of risk being given and risk being taken away. And then he qualifies it because we're in a situation that we do not perform. We do not give in accordance with the expectations of being given. There is that wonderful story. Just to understand the perfect system, the perfect level of these grand human beings that we are trying to emulate. Our second Imam السلام, every single week would hold a gathering where he would have a free house, where he would open his house towards the people who are homeless and the people who did not have enough food to feed their own families. The story tells us that as the gathering took place, the Imam sat with those homeless people. He sat with those people who were in such need that their clothes would be tattered that maybe they would stink, maybe they would not be able to have a conversation on the same issues that you and I are able to have a conversation about. He would sit with those very same people and allow them into his house. And then, at that point, he sees that individual opening up maybe his abba or his kaba or his jubba, whatever we understand of his jacket at that time. That homeless person opening up his jacket and sneaking food bread into his jacket. Imam Hassan salam, looks at him and says, Oh man, if you need food, do not feel ashamed to have to sneak the food and take it away with you. Take whatever you need from me. I will give to you whatever it is that you need. At that point, the homeless man responds and says, Oh Imam, please do not think that this is for me. En route, coming here. Before I came here, I saw a man who was in worse a situation than me. 
His clothes were more tattered than mine. He was breaking bread that was so hard that he was not able to break it with his own hands. He broke it on his knees. Imagine that man who lifted the gates of Khaybar with the strength in his arms that he could not even break bread from his own hands, that he had to break it on his knees. I am sneaking this bread into my jacket to give it to that man. Imam Hassan weeps profusely and says, that is not any man. That is my father, Ali ibn Abi Talib, sallallahu alayhi wa And then on another incident in the cities, we find that there is an incident whereby the commander of the faithful was so poor. He was so poor that he did not even have a second shirt for him to wear. He did not have a second shirt. It was tattered. He scrimped and saved. He put money together. Again, something that you and I may be accustomed to doing, that during times of economic hardship, we also must scrimp and save. He puts money together and eventually buys himself a new shirt. And then en route back from the market, back to his house, with that shirt in his hand, that shirt that he had saved up money for, He finds a homeless person in the street who is in more need than he is. By Allah, at least I have a house. He does not have a house. By Allah, at least I have a shirt which is new in my hands. He does not. Who is in more need, Ali or this homeless man? When I begin to understand and weigh up, I recognize he is in more need than I am. And at that point, with all selflessness, he gives that brand new shirt that he had saved up for to that homeless man. What does Quran say about such an individual? لَن تَنَارُ الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُ مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You will not achieve a grand station of righteousness until you manage to give away from that which you love most. From that which you love most. Not that old pair of sneakers that you give away because you haven't worn it for one year. Not that shirt that is torn, so I give it to charity, thinking that someone else may wear it. The grand station of a human being is the one they can give away from that which he himself wants to keep for himself. At that point, I understand that I am giving for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not to make myself feel better. The reason for the economic hardship, the reason for qadara alayhi rizqahu, is because you do not honor the orphan. Me, I do not honor the orphan. Because I do not look after the needy. Because I do not give to them. But we stated that at a deeper level, that this is broader than just the issues of me and my rizq. That all of these issues come to a point where I understand that there is a meeting of a mind that is greater than the little mind that I live in with my small world. That this verse must show me something greater. That this verse is about the awaited Savior. That these verses are about the realities that are in front of us today. There is a tradition that comes to us from our sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in which he says, and this is a most tremendous hadith, especially from the grammatical and lexical perspective. It's so short, it's a handful of words, it's five words. And yet, it is the most profound hadith we could ever come across in regards to the awaited Savior. Please understand it. In my humble opinion, which is really nothing, but in my humble opinion, this is the most profound hadith that the sixth Imam could afford you and I in regards to the awaited Savior. He says, Al Mahdi yasna'u kama san'u Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Look at how short it is. The blessing upon the Prophet at the end is as long as the hadith itself. Al Mahdi Yasna'u Kama San'u Rasulullah. Kama here plays a pivotal role. Kama can be found in the Holy Quran as well. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we have sent you, O Muhammad, Kama, just as we sent Musa to Fir'aun. Yes? He makes a likeness, a similitude here. He doesn't use the word mathal. He uses kama. We have sent you, O Muhammad, just as we sent Musa, alayhi salam. 
So this word kama is providing us with a mirror image. There is a deeper understanding of roles being played here. Therefore, Al-Mahdi yasna'u kama san'u Rasulullah. Al-Mahdi will act just as the Holy Prophet of Islam acted. Now think about this for a minute. What do we know of the Holy Prophet of Islam? What do we know of him and his companions and his methodology of expressing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's religion? How beautiful it was in expressing the realities of how he would look after people. Was he not rahmatul lil alameen? And if he was, how was he interacting with the people of his time? A society that was at some point so low in its moral capacity that they would bury their newborn baby daughters alive. A body, a system of communal tribes that warred with each other so much, so much that they had to put in four months of the Islamic year in which they would stop war with each other. Imagine what they lived like. Imagine what these people were really like at one level. But after 23 years of Rasulullah presenting Islam to them and raising their mindsets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Quran says, Kuntu khayrun ummatin ukhrajat lin nas. That you are now the very best ummas amongst the entire mankind. What did Rasulullah teach them that moved them from such a level of intellectual and spiritual decadence to the point of being called the greatest ummah that has ever lived? What did he do in 23 years? You know what he did? He taught them compassion amongst each other. He taught them how to look after each other. He taught them of the broader aspects of humanity within each other. Do you know the Holy Prophet of Islam's first ever public sermon? What's his sermon? The first sermon, and I don't mean that sermon towards his family members. That sermon where Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, was appointed as being caliph and wazir and akhi and so on and so forth. Not that. His public sermon, his first one. What does he say? He says, what's my titles? They give him the titles. I'm As-Sadiq and I'm Al-Ameen. If I was to tell you that there was an army to be situated behind this mountaintop, would you believe me? Naam, of course we would. He gains their trust. And then when he pronounces Islam to them, what is his first ever opening sermon to those people at that time? The first two statements. Afshu bis salam. The first one, greet each other with the statement of peace be upon you. The second thing, ta'am, and learn how to feed each other. This is how I want you to be as a human body, to look after each other, to understand where you can get to in terms of being brothers of each other in humanity. As the commander of the faithful has that famous statement, he may not be, he, uh, if he is not my uh, uh, brother in faith, he is my equal in humanity. And at this point, we go back to this hadith from the sixth imam. Al-Mahdi yasna'u kama san'u Rasulullah. The Mahdi will act just as the Holy Prophet of Islam acted. Now the Holy Prophet of Islam, think about this on a, on a, on a hermeneutical level. What do we mean by hermeneutics? Hermeneutics is a philosophy, a way of thought that defines how we begin to understand a thought process. When we read Quran, when we read Quran, we are trying to understand the mind of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. True? He provides me with a verse. Ya seen wal Quran al Hakim. What does he mean by this verse? Well, we're trying to understand what he means by this verse, right? So at this point, we understand that the mind of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is up here. And if my mind is not meeting the mind of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if I'm missing the point that he is telling me, then our minds are missing each other. There is a gap, a distance between myself and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to project to me. It's like that. Similarly, at the time of the Prophet, he had to deal with people who he was trying to raise the humanitarian and intellectual and spiritual level of. The Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, his mind was up here. 
But when he started his mission, the mind of the people were down here. They couldn't understand. They weren't at the point of reaching with him. But when he rose with them, when he was able to express to them human rights, when he was able to express to them the need of looking after each other, the point that only taqwa and adala differentiates a human being, not your skin color, not your gender, nothing of that matters in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once they understood that, then their minds were taken up a point and eventually they were able to meet with the mind of the Holy Prophet of Islam. That's hermeneutics. Where your mind and the mind of that person whom you are speaking with or trying to understand, meets with each other and interlocks. Now, Al-Mahdi yasna'u kama san'u Rasulullah. That Al-Mahdi will act exactly as to how the Holy Prophet of Islam acted. When the Mahdi sees the intellectual and spiritual poverties, when he sees how much economic problems there are within the system, when he sees that there are still homeless people within the cities that we live in, when he sees that there are people that do not have a single meal in the day within our cities, are we able to meet with his mind or are we missing his mind? Because his expectation is here to feed and to look after and to bring about. Whereas our mind may be, and this is a criticism of myself and not of you, that my mind is still down here because I'm not fulfilling the expectations of the awaited Savior. Therefore, our minds are missing each other and we are not meeting with each other at any point in time. The reason as to why in 23 years, Rasulullah was able to bring a community up to the point where it was called the very best of communities was because their minds met whether it be Ammar ibn Yasir, or whether it be Bilal al-Habashi, or whether it be Miqdad ibn Aswad al-Kindi, or whether it be Abad al-Ghifari, they understood what Rasulullah's mission was about, beyond just the salah and the sawm. It was about bringing humanitarian equilibrium. It was about bringing political reform, about social justice, about education for all genders, for all theories, for all ideas. At that point, they worked with him. And at that point, that's why they were able to reach the point of working together. If I, as the Shia of the awaited Savior, cannot understand what the awaited Savior wants from my time in the 21st century, whether I live in Birmingham or London or New York or Toronto, then his mind remains up here. My mind remains down here and I will never meet with the mind of the awaited Savior. And as per the verse within the Quran, that we will take your risk away from you. فَقَدَرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَهُ The risk is the 12th Imam. Is there any other greater risk than the 12th Imam in this universe? If Allah will take away that risk, and He says the reason why I'm taking away that risk is because you do not look after the poor, you do not look after the orphans, you do not look after the needy, you are willing to eat each other's wealth up. At what point do we understand that we are the cause for the continued, continued pause between ourselves and the awaited Savior? That continued reason for the block between ourself and the awaited Savior from coming back. At that point, we begin to understand risk is not just risk. Risk is so important at the mind of understanding the awaited Savior. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I give you risk and I take risk as I please, do I really think it is as simple as a $5 bill? Do I really think it is as simple as that paycheck in my bank account? Or do I realize what is the greatest risk in the world? And then I say, where is that risk being taken away? Why is that risk being taken away? And when I understand that the success of the ummah at the time of the Prophet was the minds meeting with their mission, I will reach to the point that I understand that the mission will only become a success in the ghaybah is if my mind meets with the true mission of the awaited Savior. What do we say so often in that dua in Shah Ramadan? اللهم أدخل على أهل الكبور السرور اللهم أغني كل فقير اللهم أشبع كل جائع اللهم أكسر كل عريان اللهم أقضي دين كل مدين اللهم فرج عن كل مكروب اللهم رد كل غريب اللهم فك كل أسير اللهم أصلح كل فاسد من الأمور المسلمين 
we say, my Lord, that if there is a poor person, give to him, enrich him. Allahumma aghni kulla fakir, enrich every poor person. Oh my Lord, if there is a homeless person, give him shelter. Oh my Lord, move, reform the situation of the ummah of the Muslims. When I raise my hands in Shah Ramadan and I make that dua, do I think that that dua is sufficient? Or do I think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to me, well, what are you doing to change that situation? When I come across a poor person lying in Grand Central, or when I come across a person in whatever st- train station, and he's lying on that bench, and he has no socks, and he has a carrier bag full of food that he has taken from the bins, and I raise my hand and I say, oh my Lord, Allahumma ghni kulla faqir, does my Lord drop a bag of $50 bills in that man's pocket? Does he do that? Of course he doesn't. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, become my hand on earth. And I will want to see you give that man the money that he requires to look after himself. You become my hand upon earth at that point. And therefore, when we raise our hand and we recite that dua, I cannot expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fulfill those requests unless I am the one fulfilling those requests. And at that point, when I understand and I come to the realization that I am the cause, I am the cause for this risk being taken away, in the same way that I strive to improve the level of wealth that comes to me on a monthly basis, I will also strive to improve that risk that will be returned back to me as soon as possible. That greater risk being the awaited Savior. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the last verse of Surah Al-Mulk, can you see Surah Al-Mulk, Surah Al-Mulk, Surah Al-Mulk tonight? In that last verse of Surah Al-Mulk, قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُمْ إِنْ أَسْبَحَ مَا أَكُمْ غَوْلًا فَمَا يَأْتِيكُمْ بِمَا إِمَّئِينَ Say, if I was to take away your water, who would return it back to you except me? The Prophet, the fifth Imam, and the sixth Imam have a concurrent tradition where he says that water, that ma, is the awaited Savior. Retranslate that verse which says, Say, if I was to take away your twelfth Imam, who would return him back to you except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? At that point, this verse looks completely different, doesn't it? The reason why you don't have risk is because you didn't honor the orphan, you do not honor the yatim, you do not look after each other, it changes. Because I realize the moment I fulfill those obligations, maybe, just maybe, he will come back. Maybe, just maybe, he will come back. We see here many different ways to understand this. Honoring the yatim, we will come to on the, in some depth, on a different way to look at it, on the ziyarat majlis on the twelfth night. And we will show you this verse that says, you do not honor the yatim. The yatim being spoken about is the master of the martyrs, Abi Abdullah al Hussein, Sayyid al Shuhada, Salawatullah wa Salaamu Alaykum. You do not honor the yatim, he says. You do not honor the yatim, that yatim. Which yatim? The yatim that had to see the door follow upon, fall upon his mother Zahra. That very yatim that you do not honor, meaning the enemy tyrants, you do not honor the yatim, which yatim? That yatim which had to stand and take his father back towards the house when there is blood falling from his head. You do not honor that yatim, which yatim? That yatim which had to bring that father back, in which Sayyidah Zainab was standing at that door to say, Oh Father, what has happened towards your forehead? You do not honor that yatim, which yatim, that yatim that had to stand at the deathbed of his brother Hassan and say, Oh my dear brother, what wasiyah can I take from you? You do not honor that yatim, which yatim, that yatim, that had to send his own young son out first into the battlefield from amongst his, father, from amongst his family. You do not honor that yatim, And you do not honor him. You do not feed the poor. Which poor? The poor that at this point in time, they have left their houses in Medina. They have left everything. They do not have a sanctuary in Kufa. 
which poor, the poor that are not even able to have a drink of water because the river Euphrates has been taken away from them. And then he says to them, those tyrants, that you eat wealth from amongst yourselves, which wealth you are willing to take the wealth of the orphan, you are willing to take the inheritorship of this orphan, which inheritorship was taken? Those very earrings which belonged to Zahra, that very veil which belonged to Zahra was taken away from them. To the extent that when Zayn al Abidin stood before Yazid, and Yazid said, I now free you, go back towards Medina. And amongst the things that were put, Zayn al Abidin said to Yazid, Before I go, I want our belongings given back to us. Can you see how these verses show you Karbala within themselves? Can you see how it shows us the awaited Savior within itself? You do not honor that very Yatim. Or maybe, or maybe that Yatim was the Holy Prophet of Islam. Was he not a Yatim? Was he not the one who was found as an orphan and Abu Talib looked after him and Khadija looked after him? You do not honor the orphan. And therefore, which human being in the existence of history has ever resembled Rasulullah more than Ali in Al-Akbar? Which person in his voice resembled Rasulullah more than Ali in Al-Akbar? Which person in his gait, in the way in which he walked, in the way in which he would speak, would honor and look and resemble more than Rasulullah other than Ali in Al-Akbar? Ali al Akbar stands in front of the enemies on the morning of Ashura and he gives that famous Adhan Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Can you imagine at that point what the family must have been going through? Can you imagine what it must have been like for that family to have heard that adhan from Ali al Akbar? There is a tradition that says to us, after the death of the Holy Prophet of Islam, the great Mu'addin, Bilal al Habashi, refused to recite adhan on the basis that he felt that it would be endorsing the Khilafat of the first Caliph. He refuses from now on to ever give an adhan ever again. He says, I will not even recite that in front of the public once more. Zahra comes to him and says, Oh Bilal, please, I am in such pain that I miss my father so much. I wish for hearing what it must have been like at the time of my father. I want to recall what it was like under the safety and security, the blanket that my father gave to me. And therefore, I ask you for one last time to recite that adhan for me so I may hear it. Bilal recites, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. At that point, tears are streaming from the eyes of Zahra. But when Bilal gets to the point of Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, Zahra collapses onto the floor. She is unconscious. Why? Because she misses what the time was like under the safety and security of her father Rasulullah. I ask you, if that was the reaction of Zahra when she heard the adhan from Bilal al-Habashi, what must it have been like in the tents? What would Sayyid Zainab must have been reacting like when she heard the adhan from Ali al-Akbar? Can you imagine the tears of grief that would have fallen from Sayyidah Zainab at that point, from Sayyidah Umm Kulthum at that point? Nay, I wonder what Hussein ibn Ali must have been understanding in his heart of hearts when he looked at Ali Akbar and it resembled his own grandfather. But then the war battles, the heat is coming down. At that point now, companion after companion enters the battlefield and never returns alive. Now all the companions have left Aba Abdullah. It is now just Banu Hashim that are left. There are two traditions about how this engagement takes place. 
One tradition tells us that Ali Akbar comes towards his father and says, Oh father, allow me to enter into the battlefield as your son and as the first of Banu Hashim to come and protect you. But there is another tradition that says that Hussein himself comes towards Akbar and says, Oh Akbar, enter into the battlefield. I ask you, how must it have been like for Hussein ibn Ali to say those words to his young son? How does he tell his 18-year-old son, I want you to enter into the battlefield in complete knowledge that your body will be torn to pieces in the coming minutes? And at that point, when Abu Abdullah hears this request, or when he gives that command towards Ali al Akbar, at that point of that request being granted, he says to Akbar, O oh Akbar, go towards your mother and, grant, and ask permission from your mother. Akbar goes towards Umm Layla, O oh, Umm Layla, my mother, I have been granted permission by my father to enter into the battlefield. Do you also allow me to enter into the battlefield? Umm Layla as a mother is hesitant, but knows that this is the sacrifice that must be given as a mother. How can you see your 18-year-old son entering to that battlefield? How do you give him permission? At which point do you embrace him? But nay, at which point do you let go of that embrace? Every single mother and father in the crowd, when your son has left for that first day of school, or your son has left for that first day of university, when he has moved out, when he goes to get married, and you give him that final embrace, I ask you to look deep into your heart. How long did you embrace him for at that time? How long did you want him to be in your arms at that time? Which tear went down your eye when you saw that he was leaving from that time? I do not know how he is going to survive. Which meals he will have? Who will look after him? I wonder, O oh Layla, you were not asking those same questions. You were saying, I wonder which axe is going to embed itself into him. I wonder which sword is going to strike him. I wonder which arrow will be flung towards my young son Akbar. And eventually, Umm Layla lets go of Akbar. Akbar returns back to Abba Abdullah. He says, I have been given by my permission by my mother. Listen to the response of Abba Abdullah. Abba Abdullah says, no, I did not mean your mother Layla. I meant your mother Zainab. Go and ask your mother Zainab for permission. Go towards her. And at that point, at that point, Akbar enters into that tent and requests permission from Zainab and the rest of the ladies. It is said that the ladies, when they see this, their tent is in a state of tumult. It is as if Qiyamah has befallen upon them. How can they let this moon of Banu Hashim go at this time? How can they let the man who resembles Rasulullah enter into the battlefield? At this point, when they let him go, at that point, Akbar goes towards the tent. He lifts the door of the tent, but the tent door falls because they come and they grab Akbar again. Akbar, do not leave us. Give us five more minutes. Please embrace us for one more time. Eventually, Akbar is allowed to enter into the battlefield. He enters and he strikes the enemies and he sends them towards the hellfire. One hundred. 20 of the enemies are being struck. But the narration tells us at this point that Abba Abdullah was standing at the front of the tent and Umm Layla was standing at the front of the tent. Abba Abdullah was looking towards the battlefield and observing what takes place. Layla cannot see into the battlefield. So she looks at the face of Abba Abdullah. There are times in which he is frightened. There are times in which he is smiling. Oh Layla, why is he frightened and why is he smiling? Because when the enemy comes towards him, Abba Abdullah is afraid for his son. And at that point, there is a face of fright for what will happen to him. When Akbar dispatches of the enemy, then he is smiling in joy as to what his son is doing before Allah. And at that point, his face turns to being radiant of joy. 
Akbar's mother sees this movement from fear towards joy, fear towards joy. In the same way we find that Hajra is moving between fear and between hope, between that fear and between hope. At this point, Umm Layla raises her hands towards the sky and says, Oh Allah, you are the one who returned Ismail back towards Ibrahim. You are the one who returned Yusuf back towards Yaqub. Allow me as a mother's prayer. Grant me as a mother the opportunity to see my Akbar one last time. Akbar returns back towards the tents. And at this point, he says his final farewell to his mother. And at this point, he leaves his father again. He says to him, Oh my father, the thirst is killing me. Oh my father, the fact that I am wearing this chainmail, it is too heavy for me. Abba Abdullah says, Oh Akbar, remove the chainmail from you then. He says, Oh father, this shield is too heavy for me to hold now. I am too weak. Abba Abdullah says, Oh Akbar, cast aside that shield if that is the case. We say to you, oh, Hussein, how could you tell your son that? How was he going to defend himself at that point? And then Akbar says to him, Oh my father, I am so thirsty. Is there any drop of water that you can give? Imagine what a father must do. Oh fathers, when your young children come to you and say, Can I have some water, father? You rush towards the tap and give him some water. How can you say, Oh my dear son Akbar, there is not a drop of water available for you at this time. He says, Oh Akbar, then if you can can take any solace, take some solace from my tongue. Akbar puts his tongue in the tongue of his father's mouth. Their two tongues reach and meet. Akbar jumps back and says, Oh Father, your tongue is even drier than mine. How is it that you have been able to bear the heat of Karbala when I am in such pain? At this point, he says his final farewell to his father and he enters into the battle feels for that last time Akbar's body will not return except in pieces Akbar will not return except to be bludgeoned at this point Abba Abdullah follows his young son out into the plains of Karbala he turns around and sees his father holding his chest like this Oh, Abba Abdullah, why were you holding your chest like this? He follows him. Every step that Akbar takes, Abba Abdullah takes. Every step that Akbar takes, Abba Abdullah takes. Akbar says, Oh my dear father, why are you following me like this? Why are you following me when we have said our final khuda hafiz? He says, Oh my dear son, if you had Ali in an Akbar, the way I have Ali in an Akbar, you would not be asking such a question if you knew what it was to be a father to see his young son enter into the battlefield you would not ask me at this point in time you would not give me those words Akbar goes in towards the battlefield and he dispatches more of the enemies towards hell there is one accursed man by the name of Abi Murra Abi Murra says if I have to take the sin of every single Arab I will do so by killing this man Akbar. They say to him, if that is the case, why do you want to do that? Leave this man alone. He will be finished off at some point. Leave him. The response from Abi Murra, he says, I am going to strike him with such a deadly blow that the heart of Hussein will bleed like it has never bled before. I will instruct him. I will ensure that he cries like he never cries before. At this point, Ali al Akbar is on his horse and he is fighting so bravely with the enemies. The enemies begin to surround Akbar. They begin to strike him from the left and from the right. At this point, he is defending himself so valiantly. But one man comes from the side and he raises that sword. He strikes Akbar on the head. Akbar's head is split open and gushing with blood. At this point, Akbar on his horse, he falls 
falls and slumps over the neck of the horse with his two arms. He wraps them around the neck of the horse as if not to want to fall towards the floor. But this does not stop the enemies. They continue to strike Akbar on his back. They continue to strike Akbar on his arms. They continue to strike Akbar on his legs to the point in which the hadith says, قَطَّعُوا إِرْبًا إِرْبًا That he was cut into pieces and pieces. At that point, Abi Murra comes with that spearhead and he strikes it into the chest of Ali ibn al-Akbar. He thrusts that spearhead into the chest of Ali ibn al-Akbar. I ask you, O oh brothers, tell me how big is the chest of an 18-year-old man? But how much bigger is the spearhead that would thrust itself into that chest? It does not end there because Abi Murra sees that he is still slumped upon that horse he grasps that spear and he tries to lift Akbar off that horse to throw him towards the floor with the weight of Akbar's body the spear itself snaps in half Akbar falls towards the floor that spearhead is bedded into his chest he calls out assalamu alayka ya abata peace be upon you O oh my father the reason why he called this, this statement. Every other martyr said, Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah. Peace be upon you, Aba Abdullah. Come to my aid. Come to the aid of your beloved. Akbar did not cry out that statement. Why? Because he knew that when Hussein would get to that body, that he would be a broken human being. How can I want my father to see me in this situation? Father, accept my final salutations Hussein falls towards the floor Akbar I have gone blind I cannot see anything your poor father cannot see where you are continue to call out Abata Abata so that by hearing your voice I may be able to come to you at this point Hussein crawls upon the burning sands of Karbala he eventually comes towards the body of Ali in Al-Akbar, he cries out, Wa Aliyah, Wa Aliyah. Oh Hussein, when you saw the body of your beloved Akbar, were you calling out for Ali Akbar is Ali? Or were you calling out to your father Ali in Al-Murtada? He calls out, Wa Aliyah, Wa Aliyah. At this point, he lifts the head of Akbar and puts it into his beloved lap. Akbar extends one arm to embrace Abba Abdullah for one final time. He looks down and says, Oh Akbar, where is your second hand? He looks down and sees the hand of Akbar is covering his chest. He says to him, Akbar, what are you covering my dear beloved? Akbar cannot respond to his father. How does a son say, Father, there is a spearhead in my chest. How do you tell him to look down and see this? At this point, Akbar's hand is removed. Abba Abdullah puts his hand upon the spearhead. He looks towards Najaf. He says, Oh Father Ali, you were the one who lifted the gate of Khaybar, but you have never had to lift a spearhead from your own son's chest. Come to Karbala and see what Hussein ibn Ali has to do. I say, Oh Hussein, not only was Ali there, Fatima was there, Muhammad was there, Hassan was there, all watching what you had to do. At that point, Hussein lifts the spearhead. The blood gushes upon the beard of Abba Abdullah. Abba Abdullah washes his face with the blood of his son Akbar. At this point, there is time after to see that the head of Akbar is separated from the body of Akbar. His head is separated and it ends up going on to a spearhead. One narration tells us in Sham that as the heads were placed upon the spear and entering in towards Bazar al Sham, the women clambered around. They began to see each one of these heads. One woman looked towards the head of this noble son. They saw the head of Akbar raised upon that spear. When they saw that head, they saw it was shining with a glorious shining. 
at that point, this woman turned towards the women in Sham and said, O oh, women, weep over upon this head. May it be a day in which the mother of this child never has to see this head upon the spear. Layla raised her head. She turned towards those women and said, I am the mother of this young son. I have had to see the head of my son placed upon the spear. But I have also had to see the head of my husband, Hussein, placed upon the spear. Aba Abdullah al Hussein, his body is situated over the body of Akbar. How does he bring this body back? He begins to pick the body of Akbar back. He brings it toward the tent. The children run out. Oh, Hussein, our father, what has become of our brother Akbar? Sakina, I cannot bear to tell you what has happened to your brother Akbar. Go back into the tent. At this point, he comes comes and brings the body towards Layla and Zainab. They cry out, Oh my dear son, what has happened to you? After Qasim had passed away, the body of Qasim and Akbar was placed next to each other. At that point, Hussein sits between both these two bodies. He places one hand on the chest of Akbar. He places another hand on the chest of Qasim. He raises his hand towards the sky. He says, Oh Allah, bear witness that on this day, they have taken both the sons of Hussein ibn Ali. I am left without my my sons after these two have been taken away from me. Allah la'anatullahi ala al-qawmi al-dhalameen wa sayyalamu al-lazheena dhalamu ayyu min qalabi yankalibu inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon ma tamih Hussain ya